Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the panel International Universities Under National Pressure. The panel will be in English as two of the participants will present their papers in English and uh, therefore we will not need a translation but you will have the possibility to raise your questions of course in German at the end of the panel. Um, I would like uh, to, to introduce very briefly the panelists. Uh, it's short annually uh, from the Central European University. He's the vice rector of his university. Um, we have from the European University St. Petersburg, we have uh, Velko Vujacic. He's the provost of this university. And we have the vice president of the Ludwig Maximilians Universität. Hans van Es, who is at the same time the president of the Humboldt Foundation, of the Max Weber Foundation, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> but both are engaged in international affairs of our. Okay. Um, we already dealt with the general question of our panel in one of the uh, uh, first panels today. The science has a global claim but it exists under, under national conditions that it is that means it is financed by national institutions to a high degree and uh, it is sometimes under national pressure uh, in our general assembly in the general assembly of uh, german association of east european studies we dealt with this question already yesterday and we expressed our solidarity, but I think it's the, the main task is to in, inform ourselves and I'm very grateful that we have a possibility to be informed and to discuss with uh, two of the main representatives of the two universities. I would ask you, you uh, Reiko, first to present we'll your paper. First. Okay, thank you very much for inviting me to this conference. And uh, I'm Rick Wojcic, yes indeed, I am the provost of the European University at St. Petersburg, which in Russian is called the first vice rector. Uh, I think the main theme of this conference is, you know, in many panels, but somehow no one is calling it that, and that is called trouble. We are all in trouble, and we don't know what to do about it. Globalization is in trouble, uh, institutions are in trouble, uh, and we in Russia are in trouble with the European University, and I happen to know something about trouble because I'm from Yugoslavia and Serbia, and then I went to the States, and now I'm in Russia, and trouble seems to follow me everywhere, and I seem to follow trouble. And now there's trouble in the States, in Russia. Serbia looks pretty good. <laughs> uh, it's the irony. But we are facing a crisis of liberalism, obviously, and liberal hegemony in a general sense. Uh, in the world, and that affects academic institution, and particularly we're facing the crisis of the westernization project everywhere, uh, which was so hegemonic in the 90s and 2000s, and our, both of our institutions, the CEU and EOSP, are part of that project of westernizing Eastern Europe, westernizing it in terms of the best academic practices, the best scientific practices, and I'll say a few words about how the European University went about that. Uh, recently, just a few years ago, the atmosphere even in Russia was completely different. We had a Minister of Education who was broadly on our side, so to speak, <coughs> within limits, but on the side of progress and science. <coughs> right now, the current Minister of Education openly spoke about ending the Americanization of Russian higher education and Russian universities. And of course, it's a big paradox, because at the same time, the Russian government wants and has its, as its strategic goal that five Russian universities enter into the top 100 universities uh, in a period of time. And of course, that's not going to happen, just like no socialist economy planned economy plan was ever fulfilled. This one won't be either. Uh, but it's a goal, and you know, having goals is good. How that goal is compatible with ending Americanization? Okay, it's very strange to think about. Now, the USP is a unique institution in Russia. It is private 
it has its own endowment. I'll show you a few slides about that. Uh, it's unique that one of its mottos was that we teach differently. That is, we are not, you come to the European University and we have a graduate sitting in the audience, and you're not going to get your standard state university master's degree education and so on. You're going to get a Western style course seminar structure, you know, uh, 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 with, with, you know, familiar to you kinds of supervision <laughs> and, and faculty <laughs> governance and so on and so on. You know, and one of the other motives of the university was we're the most European of Russian universities and the most Russian of, of European universities, which sounds like a catchy slogan. But you know, behind that catchy slogan, you know, is a, is actually a reality that an American sociologist of globalization, George Ritzer, called globalization. So there's globalization and there's local, and the twain shall meet in the European University. That is, we're going to remain Russian, but we're going to become worldly, um, and we're going to you know merge global institutional forms and practices with our own traditions and local culture, and we're going to create this creative merger. Uh, and that is going to be good for Russia, good for our Western partners to see, uh, university partners and scientists, and, and good overall. Uh, so, uh, the, you know, and of course, the fact that the European University was established in Petersburg is also telling, because that is, you know, Russia's famous window to the West. Uh, it was founded in 1994 as the first Russian non-governmental postgraduate school. In America, we would just say graduate school <coughs> in social science. Uh, we have five departments, uh, economics, anthropology, history of art, history, political science, and sociology <laughs> together thus far. Uh, and of course, the initial mission was to save Soviet, Soviet Russian science, okay, because of the brain drain fear in the 1990s. So they didn't start with a BA. They said, everyone does a BA. Let's save, you know, high quality science and let's Restore it, and you know we model ourselves on Western universities. Initially, and to this day, stipends are given to the best students who are recruited into programs, and the university has its own endowment. This is our current rector, Nikolai Lakhtin, who is uh, an author of six dictionaries of what in the West we would call Eskimo language. Uh, he's a specialist of the far north. He's an ethnographer, and you know he is a, a wonderful person um, and a wonderful scholar. And uh, just to say that not everything is bad, or to show that not everything is bad, recently he was given an award by the Russian business uh, uh, community, uh, uh, the main business award in St. Petersburg, for best manager of social projects. It was a way for the business people who are supporting us to say, you know, we don't side with the government in this particular case. The government is a less homogeneous force than one would assume, but that I'll say uh, a bit later. And you see that we have also a lot of research centers who do various things. The most prominent one among them is the Center Institute for the Study of the Rule of Law, which actually is properly translated in Russian uh, as the Institute for the Study of the Application and Administration of the Law, because rule of law is still a distant goal. Let's put it that way. Uh, but it's a very it's a very innovative structure, and recently, this you know its findings are are, are um, presented to the Russian government and presidential council for the sake of judicial reform, and it has had some real big impact. Uh, we have two international programs. We had them before we lost the license, and we have international students from many countries. Uh, there is a Western-style board of trustees with lots of prominent people. You see two of them here. Oh no, I missed the, went too fast. Um, on your, on your uh, right here is Mr. Alexei Kudrin, who was Minister of Finance, uh, and still in relatively good graces of uh, the Tsar. Uh, and to your left uh, is uh, Mikhail Piotrovsky, who is head of the largest museum in the world, the Hermitage. They are our trustees, Piotrowski is the head of them, but we also have people, as you can see from this list, from Cambridge University, from Georgetown University, from Michigan. It's all very unusual for a Russian institution, and though some institutions have moved in that direction, their boards of trustees tends to be more formal, and ours is actually real. They actually do make decisions, and uh, decisions that have consequences for us foot soldiers who stay to live with them. <laughs> when the officers leave, so to speak. 
Um, and we also have a very distinguished international advisory board. And you know, as, as a provost, I have to do a bit of advertisement. Uh, uh, but we do have a former dean of Harvard, a former dean, a former head of the Carnegie Foundation, a provost from EOI Florence, you know, a former president of Stanford, and and, and some very wealthy individuals uh, to help and support us. So we also brought a lot of distinguished people to lecture at the USP, and that's also some an area in which the USP has been a pioneer. Uh, it has been a pioneer in bringing high-level, high-profile speakers, not only, you know, politicians, but also, of course, social scientists and academics, first and foremost. And it's a kind of a hub in the city for that. Uh, of course, some of these people are not in good graces uh, anymore in Russia, like Mr. McFaul, the former ambassador, but that's a separate question. This is the face of uh, the right. Uh, this gentleman here is Mr. Milonov. Uh, he protested the fact that we are teaching uh, gender studies in uh, EUSP. Uh, he uh, formally filed a complaint with the state authorities against us on the basis of his personal initiative as well as the initiative of other concerned citizens. Uh, the uh, Russian bureaucracy sent us 11 uh, supervisory agencies in 2016, finance, taxes, fire inspection, I mean, I can't even name them. There were so many chinovniki, as they say in Russian, so many bureaucrats, that it was hard to count them all. Uh, unfortunately, as a provost, I didn't have to deal with that because I'm the Minister of Internal Affairs, while well, other people are Ministers of Foreign Affairs uh, and Government Affairs. but. The point is that they keep resending these agencies. Now, it's very unusual. It's very usual in Russia that they send inspections to you, but it's very unusual for them to send 11 or 12 or 13 agencies at the same time, more or less. Uh, we got in trouble. The one that has been our nemesis is called the Federal Service for Supervision in Education and Science, or I would call it the Russian Educational Inspector. Those are the people who come and check whether your documents are in line with the accredited state programs. Now, you know, just how strange that can look. I mean, I, I came from an American experience. Every syllabus that you ever made in the university has to be translated into a 32-page document. And if they find one comma out of place, they close you down. Okay? So they found some 70 or 80 mistakes in our documents, and on the basis of that, they started, you know, persecuting us, basically. We had, uh, the, the, the story is too detailed here for, for your purposes and for our purposes, but we had a lot of courts. We tried to get our rights back. There were all kinds of complaints. You don't have a gym. It turned out that we don't need a gym because we have master's programs. We don't have undergraduate programs, and master's students don't have to do sports. They have to study science, uh, 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 and so on. Then we didn't have you know, the proper fire things. Then we didn't have the proper you know, um, uh, uh, um, uh, disability facilities, which was actually not true because we moved to a new building where we do have all the disabilities. And, and so on. So the fight has been protracted and difficult for the university. Uh, and what is worse is they also, uh, the city authorities, independently of Rosova Nazo, the educational inspector, kicked us out of this beautiful building where we had a beautiful plan of renovation. Uh, so where are we, where are we now? Uh, we don't have a license. We don't have students. We don't have a building. We have a lot of support letters. <laughs> we have a lot of demo. We had some demonstrations, uh, and uh, we can participate in worldwide university rankings because we don't have a BA program. But we participate in the U.S. rankings by discipline, and our Department of Sociology and Political Science was uh, second to the Moscow Higher School of Economics, but second among all. Russian universities in reputational rankings at, at, at 150th place, but not quite meeting the standards of the state, 5 100, but still 150 is moving up. Uh, where are we now? I would just like to say, because CEO is going to follow, they, they put us in, in, in sometimes in the same pot as the Central European University, but it's a different picture in Russia. 
It is not the government versus the university, because the government in Russia is a many-headed monster. And uh, so against us were the Rosadon and Zon structures and the educational inspector and the city authorities, and maybe someone third who is wrapped in a mystery, enveloped in an enigma, hidden in a secret, whatever Churchill said, we don't know. Uh, and on our side, supposedly, was the president himself who signed three letters of support for us, which went nowhere for mysterious reasons, and the vice presidential administration as well. So it's a bit of a mystery, actually, as to what is exactly going on. Uh, but it's not Orban versus Soros, okay? It's a little more complex in the Russian case. Uh, so what will happen? Uh, let me address that in, in, in questions and answers. Thank you. Sorry, for taking a little more time. Thank you very much. They come the next presentation will be yours. So I will stand, although I don't have a PowerPoint presentation, but uh, I'm short. I think that's a good enough excuse. So let me uh, thank you very much for the uh, invitation and uh, let me confess that I plan not only to inform you but also to complain a bit but after listening to the story of the European University in St. Petersburg I must uh, admit that we are in a very enviable situation. We have our buildings, we have our students, we have our license. So I think you should rather listen to my story in order to find out what is the difference between Russia and Hungary, what is the difference between being inside the EU and being outside of it, and whether the difference is big enough. So uh, following a little bit on the lines um, of Velko, let me present very briefly the university itself. This is just like the European University, a university specialized in social sciences and humanities, although we have natural scientists working at the university, particularly uh, mathematicians. It's also a graduate university. It is a relatively small university, English language university, and private university. Um, it's an American university in the sense that it uh, has been chartered in the United States, and its legal headquarters is in the United States, and we are accredited by American accreditation agencies. But in 2004, the Hungarian parliament passed a law, and according to this law, the um, university could develop its Hungarian arm, a Hungarian legal unit that uh, has its headquarters in Budapest and has uh, accreditation from Hungarian authorities. This double structure will become later on in, uh, important later on in the story. Um, although it's a young university, it was established in 1991 by dissident intellectuals with the financial support of um, George Soros, a financial investor. Um, in spite of its young age, it has achieved considerable success in uh, academic matters. The same QS ranking that was referred to, that came out a few uh, days ago, put the university among the first 100 uh, best universities in the world in five different disciplines, and among the first 200 in, in two or three others. Um, it, an extreme global university, so the globalization topic fits us. In, um, uh, this is per perhaps the most global higher education institution in the world. We have uh, students from 120 countries, we have faculty from more than 50 countries, and um, we have application for, I think, no, more than 40, 140 uh, countries. So it's, it's a very global institution, although originally it was uh, designed to operate as an institution that caters to the needs of a post-communist world. And even today, about half of our students come from the region, but the other half comes from different parts of the world. At the same time, it's very well-rooted uh, in the local environment. Uh, that is, we have very intense relations with Hungarian universities, very strong cooperation, uh, because we are able to attract particularly much research money. Uh, CU is one of the most successful universities in Europe in uh, uh, getting competitive grants for the European Research Council. Therefore, we also spend a lot of money in Hungary. We contribute about 30 million euros per year to the Hungarian budget. And I'm not listing all these things in order to brag, but simply to make the point that 
we had enough reasons until now to feel at home in Hungary, to feel like being uh, welcome in the country and to feel like contributing uh, to the nation in various ways. This feeling has changed somewhat in 2017, early 2017. The Hungarian parliament passed a law according to which foreign universities uh, need to meet a number of new criteria in order to operate in Hungary. I will not list all the new criteria, but um, just the most important ones. The foreign universities need to ha uh, conduct educational activities in their home country. Now, CEU is one of the many American universities that uh, uh, are chartered and accredited uh, in the United States, but do not, did not have uh, until now uh, a campus in the United States. Um, the law also requires uh, foreign universities uh, to have an uh, intergovernmental agreement behind them. So you can uh, function as a foreign university in Hungary only if your home country's government uh, had an agreement, uh, uh, um, international treaty <coughs> with the government of Hungary. And there are several other uh, criteria, most of them apply only to CEU um, as opposed to other um, foreign universities, so this is why the law was done very soon as Lex CEU. Since the law was passed, um, a number of um, new um, developments took place, none of them altering the fundamental situation completely. One of them was that the government um, in the fall decided to extend the deadline. So now um, CEU has to comply with the new criteria by uh, January the 1st, 2019. And if we don't comply, uh, then our license is withdrawn. So we will be in very sim a similar situation to the European University in St. Petersburg. Um, also, the Hungarian government um, started negotiations with the um, governor of the state of New York. These negotiations have ended um, at the end of uh, August, beginning of September, with a, a draft a treaty um, that um, would allow us to continue to operate in Hungary in fairly similar structure as today. Um, we were not part of the negotiations, so we could not influence uh, directly the text, uh, and we are not entirely happy with the treaty, but we find it acceptable. What we find uh, somewhat perplexing is why the Hungarian government does not sign the treaty. So the treaty is on the table, the treaty was negotiated by the Hungarian government, uh, their preferences are included, and yet since September, early September, um, the treaty is still on the table, the Hungarian government uh, hasn't signed it. Also, in order to comply with the new law, we have started an educational program in the United States. The, the President of Hungary said when he signed the law that uh, it's easy to comply with this new regulation because it's enough if we have a, a contract with an American higher education institution, we start a new program and that will be accepted by the Hungarian government. So we did that uh, and yet the treaty is still not signed. Now, until now I tried to present the story as if it was a story of administrative issues, but in fact, obviously it was a political story from the very beginning. Uh, the anti Soros campaign started sometime in 2015, uh, and um, we at that time uh, were to some extent worried, but also uh, still self confident because we directly asked ministers in the Hungarian government whether this com campaign will affect us. They um, told us that we should separate politics from uh, the governance of higher education, they know we are a university, we shouldn't worry. Some of my colleagues worried, I believed uh, the Hungarian government, so I was very uh, self-confident and uh, positive until uh, it turned out in um, spring of 2017 that actually the government has been working already for a half a year in complete secrecy, trying to design a law that targets the CEU. Uh, since then, the uh, government has said a few times that uh, it is accidental that uh, CEU is particularly affected by this law, but at occasions Hungarian ministers have admitted that actually this is a targeted political campaign. The minister of uh, the prime minister's office said that the government has lived in peace with CEU up to the moment when George Soros has uh, published his opinion about uh, migration. Uh, 
Uh, and because he pro proposed in 2015 that the one million migrants should be accepted by the EU, since then there is a war <coughs> between uh, George Soros and the Hungarian government, and uh, we have to live with the consequences of that. So CEU in this context is treated as a collateral damage uh, of the war uh, that the Hungarian government wages against uh, uh, an American-Hungarian billionaire. We um, have managed to uh, mobilize a considerable uh, amount of support <coughs> from um, partly the political and partly the academic uh, elite around the world, and we were particularly uh, uh, um, impressed by the support we received from Germany. So the German Chancellor, the German President, the German Chairman of the European People's Party, they all came forward and uh, supported us. We received incredible support in Hungary. There were 80,000 uh, people demonstrating uh, against the law and supporting CEU. We received incredible amount of support from Hungarian universities, from uh, professors, some of them uh, taking considerable risk, uh, assigning the petitions. So in terms of support, I think uh, we have been uh, blessed with, with incredible um, solidarity from all around the world. The question whether it makes a difference, and at this point I'm not able to <laughs> uh, conclude in that regard, um, we thought that given uh, the fact that um, it doesn't pay off electorally, particularly to Harris University. Sooner or later, the government will find some other target, and indeed, the government did find other target, but unfortunately, we were not uh, left out uh, from uh, this um, basket. We, at least me, again, uh, being uh, naive or optimistic, I hope that after the election, um, the agenda of the government will change. Probably there will be other issues that will be in the focus of the governmental communication. And therefore, uh, we can hope for a reasonable uh, compromise solution. But uh, again, there are many who worry that once the election uh, is over, um, the attention of the world will shift to other countries and other issues. And this is what the government is waiting for. And then we will face the same uh, destiny as the um, uh, European University in St. Petersburg. Again, I, I, I don't believe so. I, I think that there is um, um, th this cooperation, this solidarity that uh, uh, manifested itself in so many various ways, but particularly within the academic world, makes a difference. No country, particularly in the European Union, wants to be isolated, at least in uh, this. Uh, on these dimensions, and um, again, rationally, it doesn't make sense for a government to insist on closing the university that has um, contributed in so many ways to the national higher education. Uh, we are flexible, we are open for whatever uh, uh, reasonable uh, demand uh, comes to us from the government side. Unfortunately, in the last uh, almost a year, nobody is talking to us uh, from the government. So we, uh, we are not in position to, to kind of um, uh, monitor how um, the demands vis-a-vis -vis CEU are changing or whether there are any specific demands. About uh, three days ago or four days ago, the spokesperson of the Hungarian government said that CEU is not up to the standards of the Hungarian government. He himself got his PhD at uh, our university. <laughs> um, and, and when the uh, journalist asks, so what if, what if we meet those standards, then he said, we will see what will happen then. Um, that much about rule of law and uh, legal certainty. <coughs> Having said that, again, uh, I think it matters how the world reacts. It matters particularly how universities around the world and academic around the world react. And in this room, there are many people who supported us in various ways, so uh, let me just conclude by thanking them. Thank you very much for um, Hans von Essen's next. Yeah, uh, I have a slightly difficult task now uh, to comment on these uh, two uh, excellent presentations of uh, two universities, uh, which uh, LMU is linked to. Welcome to. 
the provost of ESP and the vice director of uh, um, of CEU. Uh, we are linked uh, to AUSP for years through the Venice International University and uh, since 2017 we are also linked to CEU because we are uh, both members uh, and we became member of that network in 2016 of the Europeum in uh, Oxford uh, which decided to include um, the Central European University in reaction um, to the laws mm -hmm. passed in 2017. So uh, we actually believe uh, in cooperation and in uh, scholarly networks at this university. We do think that this offers some kind of protection against uh, what happens uh, here on some uh, levels, especially on the political level. And, uh, I would actually like to leave the academic uh, field a little bit in the few words that I'm going to make uh, in order to put this into a broader picture as I personally see it. We do see that the world has indeed changed a lot since the Iron Curtain came down in 1989. And in many places in Central and in Eastern Europe, uh, Europe enthusiasm was followed by sobriety and then even by disillusionment. As a sinologist, I watched how easy it was for the leaders of the Chinese Communist Party to keep the Chinese people under control by explaining the failure of Harvard economics in Russia and some parts of Central Europe. And indeed, for those of us who did have the chance to speak to Russian academics at the beginning of this millennium, uh, we know why that worked so well in China. They all believe the story that uh, Russia went the wrong way in accepting too much American advice uh, at the end of uh, or at the end of the uh, uh, 20th century. The discourse on the failure of Western economics in Eastern Europe and China was soon paired with a debate on the human rights issue that was displayed as an American reaction to Chinese economic growth. Western politicians were forced to raise the human rights issue by journalists of their own countries whenever they came to China were conventionally ridiculed as puppets of the CIA who did not understand their own role, especially after the invasion of Iraq in 2003 when the Chinese began to proudly insist even more on their own white book on human rights that China has first, had first published in 1991 as a response to Western criticism of its suppressing the Tiananmen demonstrations. In fact, in 2000, uh, 2002, just one year before the war, the Chinese had for the first time published a white book on the human rights record of the United States. The last one of these uh, came out as late as in April 2016. Human rights, the matter of human rights, has become a political weapon. In Europe, disillusionment in monetary matters during the 90s was when the financial situation slowly improved, followed by disillusionment over demographics, a topic that people rarely speak about, but which I think is tremendously important. In most Central and Eastern European countries, just as in Eastern Germany, um, in the West this had taken place a little bit earlier, birth rates rapidly dropped far below the reproduction rate after 1989, with about one-fourth of women without a migration background remaining childless to the day here in Germany, as a report by one of our institutes in Berlin recently said. An aging population found out that globalization apparently entailed a shrinking population. I see the rise of what is, in my opinion, quite inadequately and very imprecisely, uh, imprecisely termed right-wing populism as a reaction to fears of marginalization that this phenomenon has entailed, fears, uh, fears that are not very often spoken about in our public media. Our solutions to gender issues do seem to be help helpful as far as equality issues are concerned, but not really to solve these problems. And the migration crisis of 2015, of course, has strengthened, uh, strengthened that movement which had been well underway for several years before that. Western European civilization that proudly thought to have won the Cold War in 1989 
all of a sudden has begun to feel weak itself, and parts of its population seem to be most paradoxically fear demographic extinction of those values that we claim to fight for. Brexit, the US 2016 election, the rise of the Front National in France, and several other phenomena, um, among them some uh, that we can observe here in Germany, are the immediate consequences of this explosive mix mixture of demographic and migratory crisis. They are not going to be wiped away uh, easily by some academic explanations. And those who reject post-1989 answers to the trinity of the issues of gender, migration, both topics that came up in your presentations, and individual human rights today have begun to win elections or at least to gain a considerable share of the votes, not just in East and Central Europe, but uh, all over the world, we have to face that. Um, as I see it, the situation is difficult for universities that have been founded in Central and Eastern Europe precisely because they were founded when enthusiasm for Western and European and American ideas were widespread. Uh, the enthusiasm now seems to have been replaced by, by a feeling of deep insecurity in these countries about how to behave in a world that has completely changed. At least that is how I, as, uh, who is also the president of the Max Weber Foundation, interprets the situation prevailing in Russia, where I've been quite often during the last three years. Feelings there are, in my opinion, oscillating between assertive nationalism and the acceptance of an attractive Western style of life. For historical reasons, of course, the situation is slightly different in Poland, uh, which that we haven't spoken about here, where there's also an institute uh, founded by the German state, but feelings are also similar in many respects to those in Russia, just as they are in such places uh, that I also have to deal with uh, as Turkey, uh, with yet another institute of the foundation, also a country now very difficult to deal with, and of course, in the country of my own expertise in China, we would like to found an institute in order to promote our uh, values. But that is a very, very tricky thing in this world of today because you can't do it as uh, you would have done it 20 years ago. Go. In all these places, situations may look quite different at a national level, but they are strikingly and remarkable uh, similar when we compare the reactions uh, reaction of governments at an international level. They all counteract, some quite brutal indeed, uh, against Western ideas that seem to come as an ideology accompanying globalization, which may have made some people richer as they were before, but which also has left many others behind. And what is striking in all these countries too is that, and this is also a new phenomenon, large parts of the population are backing their governments. As a president of the Max Weber Foundation, I have to and I'm willing to deal with the cracks that in recent years have sprung up in the formerly impeccable facade of global uniformity of a belief in societal progress. Western academics should just as politicians be watchful for their own mistakes in dealing with international partners and be listening to what our friends but also difficult partners we want to tell them there may even be some truth in what all these people have to say. Otherwise, it will be very difficult to keep strong ties with our friends and partners in the great many of countries that, for the reasons that I just outlined, have over the last couple of years become more difficult to deal with for those who belong uh, to what has been described the Western community of values, whatever that may mean. I do think it's very important that we develop a prudent strategy of how to deal with these countries in the future in order to protect our friends there and at the same time to get along well with the governments. And I wish your universities both very well for the future. Thank you.
Thank you for your thoughtful comment. Now I will directly open the floor for the discussion. I promise that you can have questions at the end. So we, it's already three o'clock, but I think we should have uh, some more ten minutes to, for the discussion. Please go ahead. Uh, could, could you introduce your, yourself? Yeah, uh, Adrian Dubrov from St. Petersburg Center for Independent Social Research. Thank you very much for your presentation. I'm especially thankful for the, uh, your concern and support of the European University of St. Petersburg and alumni. But I probably will be very skeptical to, to describe the future as positive. Because I'm observing the situation with the European Humanitarian University. In Vilnius. As you probably know this story, when the one of the independent, the probably only independent university in Belarus was forced to move out of the of the city of the country, and now it is existed as a main program, complementary main program in uh, in Vilnius University. And now it's very unfortunately under under the serious threat to be closed because no support of this independent institution. So that's my question is goes to the uh, those who are thinking about the future of the university in exile. But currently we are living in the world where the university could be removed forcibly. So that's the other situation in Ukraine. You probably know there are several universities from Donbass which was forcibly removed from the and, and they are also living in the very serious circumstances in, in the in the main part of the Ukraine. So my question is, what what the international community is supposed to do with such kind of well, in universities in trouble, right? not in the situation when they are in trouble, but afterwards? Thank you very much. Other questions? Yeah. <laughs> Um, hello, my name is Lars Podobosz. Um, I live here in the city of Munich. I've got a question to Mr. Enedi. I've read that the uh, CU obtained an application for five more years. What does this exactly mean? Okay, then we, we could start with the first round of answers. Uh, who wants to react to the first question? Well, I will answer my for alarm. <laughs> uh, thank you for the question. I, I don't think we're planning to move anywhere. Um, I think like the European University that moved from Belarus to Vilnius, I don't think we're going to be kicked out, or at least I hope so. Uh, I think there would be, you know, a very big reputational problem for the authorities, or at least I hope so. Um, I do think that we will apply for, uh, not I do think, I know we will apply for a license and like the CEO, we hope that the elections will bring some clarity in Russia uh, and the government bureaucrats will be a bit more relaxed and maybe that we will actually restore our license. But if not, you know, we will continue functioning as a scientific institute for a while. What can international institutions do? I think that you know the answer was partially contained contained in in the speech of uh, Professor uh, Van Van S, which is that they have to tread tread carefully in these situations. They have to talk both to the government and <clears throat> and to the institutions. Um, and there is no there's no easy way. When people ask me what what we can do for you, you know, aside from letters of support, which are nice but largely have symbolic value. It's not bad, it's wonderful. What you can do is do something for our students, do something for our professors, give us some stipends, organize some conferences, send us some illustrious people at our expense, at your expense, to speak at the university, send us a Nobel Prize winner so we impress the government, send us a president of a university so we can put it in the news. There is public opinion in Russia. It is not, you know, a, a democratic state, but it is a state in which public opinion matters. 
And if, you know, if things deteriorate very, very badly, I think we're going to have a war in public opinion. Now, we might lose that war, and, you know, but until then, there is some time. So, you know, I wouldn't be, you know, so dark uh, uh, and so pessimistic about it. Well, maybe I'm infected by 25 years in the United States and my East European pessimistic <laughs> genes have been partially transformed by the great American tradition of voluntary associationalism and hopeless optimism. But, but I, I, you know, I don't think we're ready to lie down and surrender. Would you take the second question? Yes, one of those. I would like to um, uh, just to make a very brief uh, statement. What I think is important, I mean, I'm obviously in a completely different uh, situation than the two gentlemen sitting, sitting at this table because they have uh, to deal every day with this problem and I'm sitting here quite comfortably. Um, as a president of the Max Weber Foundation, but also as vice president for international affairs, I believe in the importance of keeping good contacts, even with some places and universities that may not always be friendly or on friendly terms with us, because we want to establish scholarly networks. As I see it, uh, academic um, uh, discussions are a form of dip diplomacy that is actually better than any other diplomacy. That you keep contact with people, you talk to them on a very natural basis, you don't have to talk about what I try to do a little bit right now, namely uh, political uh, issues, but you talk about matters that are of uh, mutual interest and then you start to understand the situation and this will develop. In my opinion, this is what we can, most of what we can actually do here in Germany. As I mentioned, the CEU has uh, both a Hungarian and an American arm. The American arm gets accreditation from the Middle States Commission on Higher Education. The Hungarian arm gets accreditation from the Hungarian uh, uh, Accreditation Board. What happened a few weeks ago was that the Hungarian uh, accreditation was renewed, uh, which is a great news. Unfortunately, it doesn't solve uh, the fundamental problem. Um, only a minority of our programs are Hungarian accredited programs, so the majority of the university is not affected by this. Also, this is about accreditation and not about the uh, license of operation. Uh, at the same time, what I, I think it's important here is to show that um, the Hungarian state treats us professionally on an everyday basis. So the accreditation process was very professional, very decent. Uh, we have been praised for our high quality uh, uh, control mechanism, for the fact that we fulfill this bridge role between the United States and Hungary in the report. So everything looks great if you uh, only look at how uh, we interact on an everyday basis with the bureaucracy. The problem is the lack of political uh, support and uh, it doesn't matter how far we go in complying with the legal and academic standards, if there is no political support, uh, we, can, we still need to worry. At the same time, uh, the fact that we have a Hungarian arm it gives us more protection than as if we had only an American one. Because even if the American one loses its uh, license of operation, the Hungarian can still continue. The question is whether it makes sense to continue because the two have been built up on each other and the Hungarian, as I mentioned, is only a smaller part of the entire university. Thank you very much. As, as Hans van Es already said, the, the situation of the European universities in Budapest and in Petersburg concern us because uh, these universities are our partners not only in Munich but at many universities in, in Germany and in Europe. And for another reason, I think the university is a genuinely, genuinely European institution uh, and in the sense of University history in Russia is a European country since, since the 18th century, since the founding of the first university in Moscow. Uh, so therefore, I'm very grateful that this panel could 
uh, happen here. And thank you for, especially for, for the vice presidents, two vice presidents of the European University in Budapest and in Petersburg, because it's not an easy task to present the situation to a foreign audience. Wir sind etwas knapp in der Zeit, aber wir haben noch ein, ein Viertelstunde. Ich möchte schon jetzt darauf hinweisen, dass Ruprecht Polenz ganz pünktlich um 16.45 Uhr den Raum hier verlassen muss, um seinen Zug noch zu bekommen. Aber ich glaube, ein, ein Viertelstunde werden uns ausreichen nochmal für eine Abschlussdiskussion zum Thema Staat und Globalisierung in Europa vom Regieren jenseits der Staatlichkeit zur Rückkehr des Staats. Und mit diesem Abschlusspanel kommen wir schon noch mal zur Ausgangsfrage zurück, äh, zu dem Verhältnis von Globalisierung und politischer Ordnung. Und dabei geht es jetzt nicht nur um die Frage, ähm, wie Systeme auf die Globalisierung reagieren, sondern es geht politische Systeme, sondern es geht auch darum, wie Politik auf äh, Globalisierung reagieren sollte. Das heißt, in äh, diesem Panel sprechen wir durchaus auch über Handlungsempfehlungen. Wir schlagen die Brücke jetzt von der Wissenschaft in die Politik. Und äh, ich denke, meine beiden Gesprächspartner sind dafür prädestiniert. Ich stelle sie Ihnen kurz vor. Ich begrüße zu meiner Rechten Jerry Schöpflin, Politikwissenschaftler. Er arbeitete unter anderem für Chatham House und BBC in London war mehrere Jahre lang Jean Monnet Professor für Politik an der School of Slavonic and East European Studies in London. Und seit 2004 ist er Abgeordneter im Europäischen Parlament für die ungarische Partei Fidesz, wie die heute mal schon gehört haben, den ungarischen Bürgerbund, wenn ich das setze. Und erlauben Sie mir an dieser Stelle kurz zu sagen, Herr Schöpflin, ich habe mich sehr gefreut, dass Sie auch gerade bei dem vergangenen Panel hier dabei waren. Sie haben den direkten Kontakt zu Viktor Orban und wir würden uns natürlich alle freuen, wenn Sie die Besorgnisse über den Zustand der Central European University auch an Herrn Orban weitergeben würden. Zu meiner Linken begrüße ich Ruprecht Polenz. Er ist Jurist, war von 1994 bis 2013 Mitglied des Deutschen Bundestags. Von 2005 bis 2013 war er Vorsitzender des Auswärtigen Ausschusses im Bundestag. Er ist heute unter anderem Mitglied im Beirat des Center for Global Politics der Freien Universität Berlin und, wie Sie alle wissen, Präsident der Deutschen Gesellschaft für Osteuropa. Es geht um politische Ordnung in Europa und ich möchte am Anfang äh, gleich betonen, dass wir uns hier in unserer Podiumsdiskussion tatsächlich auch auf die Europäische Union fokussieren werden. Das heißt, es geht um die EU auch als ein Beispiel für politische Ordnung. Die Perspektive auf Europa als Ganzes äh, und natürlich auch auf das weiter östliche Europa kann dann natürlich in der Diskussion mit Ihnen noch ausgebreitet werden. Und ich möchte beginnen mit dem Verhältnis von globaler Verflechtung und Entwicklung der Europäischen Union. Ähm, wir wissen, die Europäische Union wurde in den 50er Jahren gegründet als eine Wirtschaftsgemeinschaft und nicht nur die Zahl der Mitglieder, sondern auch die Funktion der Europäischen Union sind über die sechs bis sieben Jahrzehnte gewachsen und aus der Wirtschaftsgemeinschaft ist inzwischen eine politische Union geworden. Und Ruprecht Polenz, von Ihnen wüsste ich gerne als erstes, inwiefern sich die globalen Verflechtungsprozesse auf die Strukturen und das Selbstverständnis der EU ausgewirkt haben. Die europäische Idee war neben der wirtschaftlichen Integration die einer Friedensordnung für den Kontinent. Und es ist zunehmend als dritte Idee neben Wohlstand und Frieden die Idee gekommen, die Europäische Union ist die Antwort auf die Herausforderung der Globalisierung. Um das zu verstehen, muss man jetzt schon noch mal einen Schritt zurücktreten und auf die Welt schauen. Karl Kaiser hat im Ausblick auf das 21. Jahrhundert die Aufgaben mal so beschrieben oder die, das Szenario, es geht um Integration versus Fragmentierung auf dieser Welt. Und äh, wenn äh, wir diese Welt anschauen, dann haben wir 
neue Machtzentren, multipolare Welt, nennen Sie es, wie Sie es wollen, mit den USA, mit den Chinesen, mit den Indern, mit Russen, mit anderen. Und wenn wir uns jetzt erstmal als Deutsche fragen, wo bleiben wir da, da ist die Antwort, dann kommen wir noch lange nicht. Und die Europäische Union würde aber schon kommen, denn sie vertritt 500 Millionen Menschen und etwa ein knappes Viertel der Weltwirtschaftsleistung, etwa so viel wie die USA. Und deshalb äh, ist im Grunde die Aufgabe, vor der die Europäische Union steht und wie sie etwa in der Finanzkrise auch ganz gut, wie man in der Formel Einsprache sagen könnte, auf die Straße gebracht hat, die gemeinsamen Interessen ihrer Mitgliedsländer auch weltweit zu vertreten und durchzusetzen. Also weder Deutschland, Großbritannien muss ich jetzt nachher sowieso anderen Erfahrungen stellen, noch Frankreich, Italien, von den kleineren EU-Ländern gar nicht zu reden, werden in der Lage, bestimmte lebenswichtige Interessen, die wir haben, die wir auch gemeinsam haben, alleine zu vertreten. Und weil wir diese Interessen gemeinsam haben, übernimmt die Europäische Union die Aufgaben, die ein Nationalstaat nicht mehr stemmen kann. Und diese Interessenpolitik, letzter Satz, kann die Europäische Union nur deshalb wahrnehmen, weil wir auch gemeinsame Werte haben. Außenpolitik hat immer mit Werten und Interessen zu tun, aber eine Interessenvertretung ohne gemeinsame Werte wird auf die Dauer nicht funktionieren. Und deshalb ist es so wichtig und eben heute auch herausgefordert, dass die Europäische Union zu den Werten steht, die sie in den Verträgen aufgeschrieben hat und die in vielen Ländern der Europäischen Union auch gelebt werden, in manchen jetzt allerdings in Frage gestellt werden. Mhm. Danke. Äh, Jerzy Schöpflin, Sie waren leider gestern Abend noch nicht da. Äh, in dieser Eingangsdiskussion ist schon noch mal ganz deutlich äh, betont worden, dass Globalisierung sehr äh, angstbesetzt ist. Globalisierung wird als ein äh, beängstigendes Phänomen von vielen wahrgenommen. Und selbst in unterschiedlichen, sehr unterschiedlichen, konträren Positionen zur Europäischen Union spiegelt sich diese Angst vor der Globalisierung wider. Die ähm, Befürworter der Europäischen Union sehen diese auch als einen Schutz vor den Auswirkungen der Globalisierung, einen Schutz vor den globalen Weltmächten. Die Kritiker der Union in ihrer augenblicklichen Verfasstheit sehen die EU als einen Motor für diese als so beängstigend empfundene Globalisierung durchaus auch als eine zersetzende Kraft. Und dann kommt es ein bisschen auf die Perspektive an, ob man sagt, die EU zersetzt eigentlich den Nationalstaat oder die EU zersetzt den Sozialstaat. Würden Sie sich einer dieser Positionen zuordnen? Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, before I come to your question, sure. which will require a complex answer, of course, uh, let me decode myself. I mean, here I am in Germany. I have a German name, but I'm not German. My family was, but they left Germany 250 years ago. They went to Hungary. Why did they go to Hungary? Well, it was part of the Austrian Empire of the Baden. Uh, they went east instead of going west. Um, so I'm Hungarian. I know I sound English, but then my parents were refugees from communism, so I grew up in the United Kingdom. And those of you who listen very carefully might just hear a faint Scottish accent as I grew up in Scotland. Um, and also, just to complicate, possibly your lives, but certainly mine, I am both a political practitioner and a political theorist. The two are not the same. At least that's been my experience uh, over the last 13 and a half years. So, starting from that, uh, let me try and uh, answer your point from a slightly different perspective, which is to say to you, you talked about globalization. I think actually there are many globalizations, which is part of the problem. We see it as a single process, whereas I think in reality uh, there's the globalization of money. Uh, money has now become independent of any state. It can be corporate economies. That's a form of globalization which we really didn't have, let's say, 30 years ago, even when I was young. Um, secondly, there's the globalization of information. 
Well, this is technology. Um, it, to me, because I'm no longer that young, I mean, I can still do it. Do you still remember the typewriter? You know, hit the keys. Dead technology. It's all moved on. The speed of communication, um, the multiplicity of sources of information, you no longer, by the way, have any means of determining its reliability. But crucially, the monopoly of information which was possessed by the state is now no longer the case. And when we talk about fake news and things of this kind, that's partly, uh, I suppose, a result of that. And there's also a globalization of demographic movements uh, from outside Europe into Europe, and to some extent still, I think, from Europe to non-Europe. Bear in mind that in the 18th century, and onwards, there was an enormous movement of Europeans to the rest of the world, like this had been reversed. Um, that's part of the, the globalization story. To which I would add, I think, that there are also, if you like, um, globalizations uh, projected by various political actors, of which I'll talk of, talk of it as the West, although I think has always been a divergence between Europe and the United States. But let's say the Washington Consensus is one concept of globalization. There's also a Chinese concept of globalization. There's a Russian concept of, in a way, anti-globalization. There's also a Muslim concept of globalization. I mean, I don't know if any of you have read uh, Maududi or Said Gut, uh, to some Khomeini. There is a, a Muslim concept of transforming the world. I see it as a, a concept of globalization. So, I would say, think about multiple globalizations, and the European Union is just one actor among many, although it continues to think that it is the actor. This is an error. Uh, I would suggest to you in the first instance that the European Union is a pre-globalization institution um, and hasn't really come to terms, that's certainly my experience in Brussels, with what globalization means. Uh, one of my committees, in fact, it's really the most important committee that I work on, is the Constitution Committee of the European Parliament. And we, I produced a paper on globalization very recently. It's not been published yet, maybe it never will be, in which I made these arguments, and my wonderful colleagues couldn't make out of them. Um, for them, globalization is basically what the West does, uh, rather than this multiple, multi layered set of processes. What I would argue is what the European Union has been very, very good at from the outset is conflict resolution and dealing with asymmetric power. Now, Europe is a space of asymmetric power. If you look at all the various uh, collectivities, high cultures, they will always generate friction. The problem is not conflict, there will always be conflict. The problem is, how do you resolve the conflict? And here I think the European Union has done a very good job. I and mean, you will recall that the European Union was called into being in order that there should not be another war between France and Germany. Superbly successful. Um, and to this day, I think that that conflict resolution dealing with asymmetric power works not badly. Let me give you an illustration from my part of the world. Uh, I think this was in 2008, but I opened a correction. Uh, on the website of the Slovak National Party, the Slovenska Narodna Strana, there appeared a map of Central Europe from which Hungary had disappeared. It had been carved up, you know, some of them went to Slovakia, some of them went to Romania, even the Austrians got to, I'm sure the Serbs and Croats got a lot of territory. Now, you would imagine that everybody in Budapest would have gone hysterical. Nobody paid a blind bit of attention. Because, you know, we knew in the European Union, the Slovaks were also in the European Union. This is just a bit of exaggerated nonsense. Jan Slota, whose name may or may not mean anything to you, he was the architect of this. I'm told, I've never met him, uh, that he deeply loathes Hungary, can't bear Hungary and Hungarian. I think his uh, mother in law was Hungarian. Uh, <laughs> I'm told that that's the explanation, but be that as it may. Now, um, the last point I want to make in this context, and this is, this is the part that worries me. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a moderate integrationist, I'm not a federalist. I do think that European integration is a desirable set of processes. 
as far as it goes. Uh, subsidiarity should be much more real than it is. But the problem that I see, um, you will all, I think, be familiar with uh, Massim, Nicholas Stalin's work, uh, Black Swan and Anti-Fragility. There's not enough uh, leeway built into the European Union. There's too much tightening. So when there are unexpected shocks, and that's Stalin's Black Swan, the European Union really doesn't know what to do. That's the 2008 crisis. That's the crisis of the euro, which is still with us. There's still no solution. And I think, but I hope I proved wrong, that the Italian election result is another such crisis which may very, very seriously affect the future of the euro. Thank you for the moment. Vielen Dank. Ich komme gleich noch mit einer zweiten Frage zu Ihnen. Und zwar möchte ich etwas aufgreifen, was heute Morgen im ersten Panel diskutiert wurde. Wir wissen, dass die Regierung in Polen und in Ungarn zunehmend EU-kritisch sind und auch Teile der Bevölkerung. Was ich sehr interessant fand heute Morgen, wir stellen uns immer vor, diejenigen, die am meisten auch Sorgen innerhalb der EU haben, sind diejenigen, die... Ja, denen es schon am schlechtesten geht, sozusagen. Heute Morgen hieß es, dass im Grunde genommen diejenigen heute in der Bevölkerung, die kritisch sind, auch diejenigen sind, die etwas zu verlieren haben. Stimmen Sie dieser These zu und wenn, was haben die genau zu verlieren in der EU? Me? Ja. Okay. I'm not going to speak about the uh, I don't read Polish, uh, I don't have the authority, but I can tell you about Hungary is this. Hungary is committed to European Union and European integration, but not to a federal Europe. That is a central distinction. Uh, basically, uh, in slightly sloganistic terms, strong Europe, strong member states. Um, I don't think these are in contradiction. Some people do, my Federalist friends and colleagues in Brussels, uh, hate this idea that you can have strong member states if the, your conflict resolution and other commitments are adequate, which I think they probably still are. Um, the second point I want to make is please don't believe what you read in the newspapers. Uh, I, you know, the Western media have invented an imaginary Hungary. Those of you who know the work of Benedict Anderson, imagine communities, it's an imagined Hungary. The reality is really quite different. Let me give you a couple of bits of evidence. Um, I don't suppose any of you ever look at the European Union Commission's Justice Scoreboard. This assesses the workings of the legal administration in all the 28 member states, soon to be 27 of course. Hungary does not badly. We're in the top third. If you're really worried about the rule of law, please look at Italy. Uh, constitutional court. Now, you want to read in the media, uh, constitutional court has been eviscerated, other such uh, physical, medical um, tests, sort of things to which it has been subjected. Now, I actually, technically, of course, as a member of the European Parliament, I shouldn't do the separation of spheres, but I do meet with the members of the Hungarian Constitutional Court about once a year. Um, and what I hear from them, uh, and, that, and they also, by the way, give me uh, data, it's, unfortunately it's in this impossible language called Hungarian, um, it's very clear that over the last six years, I think, basically since the present government has been in power, they keep sending laws back to Parliament. They quash legislation. Uh, this is not an eviscerated constitutional court. Um, and if you want a little bit of technicality, the mother principle of the Hungarian legal system is human dignity. And on the basis of human dignity, the Hungarian Constitution Court can quash any law that it wants to, and sometimes it does. So these stories of the end of the rule of law in Hungary and all that are merely stories uh, to amuse Western journalists because they want uh, they want the target country uh, where they say everything is fine here but things are terrible there. And one last thing, on the money side, as you will probably know, uh, it's been widely argued 
that there should be conditionality on the structural and, and cohesion funds. Um, this at the moment is of course not legal, but the new MFF may make it legal. Um, this would be a blow, but whether it's correct or not, uh, that's certainly the attitude and the, the view that I heard. There was a, a Visegrad 4 summit on the 28th of January, I attended the panel discussion. There's great confidence that it's the economies of these four countries which are driving Europe forward. And that the trade, the, the, the turnover between the Visegrad 4 and Germany is larger than the trade between Germany and France. Now, on this basis, these four countries are still net recipients, uh, they won't be for very much longer, which means that the possibility of using this conditionality is dying fast. Um, Brussels doesn't like it, but on the other hand, Brussels can't do everything. Mm -hmm. uh, in the card, the EU uh, is all about the Binnenmarkt. Ähm, die Befürworter der EU vertrauen darauf, dass eben über den freien Austausch von Menschen, von Waren, von Dienstleistungen, äh, dass davon letztendlich alle profitieren. Das ist eines der Versprechen der, der Europäischen Union, der, der Wohlstand. Äh, trotzdem ist es ja in der Tat so, und äh, das sehen wir in den letzten Krisen, es gibt dieses sehr große Wirtschaftsgefälle innerhalb der Europäischen Union und äh, es gibt eben nicht nur das Problem der Staatsverschuldung. Äh, Arbeitslosigkeit ist ein sehr großes Problem in einigen Ländern, in Spanien, in Italien, in Griechenland. Und Ruprecht Polenz, ich wüsste gerne von Ihnen, ähm, kann die EU ihr Wohlstandsversprechen einlösen oder ist sie eben noch ein Katalysator für, das ist ja ein Vorwurf, für eine zunehmend ungleiche Verteilung von Gütern? Also ich will es mal anders machen, als man das bei Diskussionen üblicherweise macht. Ich sage, ich komme gleich zu der Frage und dann sage ich noch was anderes. Ich mache jetzt mal umgekehrt. Ja, es ist richtig, wir haben soziale Verwerfung in der Europäischen Union. Wir haben zum Beispiel in Südländern eine irrsinnig hohe Jugendarbeitslosigkeit. Und jetzt stellt sich die Frage, ist das wegen der Europäischen Union oder trotz der Europäischen Union. Und die Frage kann man eigentlich nur beantworten, wenn man sich Länder außerhalb der Europäischen Union anschaut, die mit vergleichbarer Wirtschaftsstruktur vor ähnlichen Problemen stehen. Und da äh, glaube ich, wenn Sie äh, nach Osten gehen, äh, sich Armenien anschauen oder Georgien oder äh, meinetwegen auch die Ukraine, dann werden Sie nicht zu dem Ergebnis kommen, dass es diesen Ländern besser geht, weil sie nicht in der EU sind. Und äh, ich sehe das auch ziemlich pragmatisch. Ähm, es ist jetzt nicht so, dass man die Länder des westlichen Balkans in die EU prügeln müsste. Sondern sie haben das Gefühl, warum sind wir noch nicht drin, wir wollen da rein, weil wir uns davon was versprechen. Und das ist mindestens der Umgang mit erwachsenen Menschen, dass man sagt, wenn sie äh, das selber für sich für besser halten, dann soll das wohl auch so sein. Und nicht, dann wissen wir es besser, das würde euch schaden und deshalb nehmen wir euch nicht auf. Also äh, bei der Jugendarbeitslosigkeit ist es offensichtlich so, dass äh, äh, zwei Länder innerhalb der Europäischen Union das besser hinkriegen, Deutschland und Österreich. Da ist immer die Quote der Jugendarbeitslosigkeit unter der allgemeinen Arbeitslosigkeit. In allen anderen Ländern ist es umgekehrt. Und das liegt eben in diesen beiden Ländern an der dualen Ausbildung, die das Scharnier zwischen Schule, Ausbildung und Beruf dichter schließt, als eben in den Ländern, wo die Schüler entlassen werden. Und da müssen sie eben wie gucken, wie es weitergeht. Und dann fallen sie eben bei wirtschaftlich schlechter Lage in die Arbeitslosigkeit. Das ist also ein strukturelles Problem, hat mit der Europäischen Union ziemlich wenig zu tun, bietet jetzt aber in der EU die Möglichkeit über entsprechende Programme, wenn die Regierungen das wollen, über solche Veränderungen des nationalen Bildungssystems nachzudenken. Also meine These ist, ja, wir haben diese Probleme, wir können sie aber innerhalb der Europäischen Union leichter angehen und tun das auch. Die ganzen Diskussionen über Nettozahler, Nettoempfänger haben ja letztlich auch einen Grund darin, dass es bestimmte Umverteilungsmechanismen gibt, die würden ohne Europäische Union eben auch nicht da sein. Also 
In Deutschland läuft die Diskussion ja gerade andersrum, warum zahlen wir so viel und kriegen so wenig raus. Und äh, da ist mein Hinweis auch immer, man muss das Gesamtbild sehen, es geht nicht nur um, die, äh, um das Geld, was man von Brüssel kriegt oder was man nach Brüssel einzahlt, sondern die Vorteile gehen ja äh, viel weiter, äh, etwa für die Wirtschaft, aber auch für jeden von uns persönlich. Also was ist es für einen Ungarn wert, äh, dass er von Lissabon bis Warschau äh, reisen kann, ohne den Pass vorzeigen zu müssen. Kann man schwer kapitalisieren, ich finde es ist aber eine ganze Menge wert. Und äh, deshalb äh, glaube ich, müssen wir über sozusagen den Wert der europäischen Integration umfassender reden. Und mein Eindruck ist, dass diejenigen, die gerne dazukommen wollen, das teilweise besser verstanden haben als manche, die drin sind. Das Zweite, was ich jetzt gerne noch sagen wollte, in Anknüpfung an das, was Herr Schöpflin gesagt hat. Ich war jetzt ein bisschen überrascht, weil in der Tat mein Ungarnbild stammt jetzt nun nicht aus ungarischen Medien, weil ich kein Ungarisch kann. Ich bin auf diese westliche Lügenpresse angewiesen. Nichts anderes haben Sie ja gesagt. Und äh, jetzt will ich aber nicht in diesen Disput, weil ich kann ja nachher nicht überprüfen, ob äh, der Spiegel oder der Stern oder die Süddeutsche oder die FAZ das richtig berichtet hat, äh, sondern ich will einen Punkt nehmen, äh, da werden wir beide sehen, ja, der hat sich so abgespielt. Äh, Sie haben Rechtsstaat angesprochen und das ist eine zentrale Kategorie, die wir alle gemeinsam haben, praktisch die Eintrittskarte in die Europäische Union, neben Demokratie, der Rechtsstaat, die Achtung der Menschenrechte. Und zum Rechtsstaat gehört, dass im Streitfall die Gerichte das letzte Wort haben. Punkt. Auch wenn ein Land verurteilt wird, hat das Gericht das letzte Wort. Und der Europäische Gerichtshof hat Ungarn dazu verurteilt, die Flüchtlingsquoten zu erfüllen, die die Europäische Union beschlossen hat. Und Ungarn sagt, das tun wir aber trotzdem nicht. Und damit verstößt Ungarn gegen ein zentrales Prinzip Europäischer Union der Rechtsstaatlichkeit, und zwar kollektiv als Staat. Und das ist ein dickes Problem. Herr Schöpfli, möchten Sie darauf direkt reagieren? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I deeply agree with the point about freedom of travel. I would extend it even further. I think the most southerly point of the European Union is, I think, Martinique in the Caribbean. Yeah. And at the opposite yeah. end, I suppose, it's Romani in the north of Finland. Oh. Or, never mind. Uh, so I entirely agree, by the way, not just in terms of individual freedom of travel, but the, the goods. The fact that there's no customs check and when, when Brexit happens, there will be terrible problems in both Calais and, and Folkestone. Um, on capital, the role of capital, now, there's no question in my mind that the entry of Western capital to Central Europe played a very important and in many ways positive role in modernizing uh, the existing plant. Uh, the difficulty is uh, that the model of relying overwhelmingly on foreign investment is now largely exhausted. Uh, and secondly, as has been shown in the last well, 13 years really, um, it makes domestic capital accumulation very difficult. Uh, this is what the Hungarian government has done uh, to buy back various uh, items that were sold off by its uh, left-wing predecessors um, and to build up local human capital and other forms of capital. Uh, one very worrying statistic is that in 2004 uh, the table of GDP per capita per country as far as the former communist countries were concerned, I call them the EU11 for short, um, Slovenia and the Czech Republic were ahead of Portugal and Greece. All the other EU15 countries were well ahead uh, of the EU11. Italy was roughly in the lead, as I recall it. In 2012, that had not changed. So the great dream of catching up, of overtaking, of 
pulling up or getting to, let's say, hypothetically, the Swedish GDP per capita has not happened. And part of that story is the function of the EU. Uh, I was talking to an Estonian friend of mine on Monday uh, in Tallinn, and um, he said, of course, of course it hasn't. And then he went back to centre periphery theory. We talked a bit about water steam, the idea that the centre will never allow uh, the periphery or the semi-periphery to acquire uh, the same level of power, investment, economic power that the centre itself has. And that has been reproduced in all sorts of, I think, unintentional ways by the functioning of the European Union. Finally, uh, on, well, before I come to the refugee issue, I just want to point one thing out to you. Uh, the European Union has problems with a number of member states where it claims that the rule of law has question marks over it. Poland and Hungary are in the firing line. Strange to say, Malta and Romania, just to mention two, are somehow not on that list. Why? Well, they both happen to have centre-left governments. And Timmermans, uh, the Vice President of the Commission, who is responsible for this area, basically says, I'm not moving against left-wing governments. I've heard him more, more or less say this in public, in a plenary debate. Now, at that point, you have another standard. So it seems to me that Hungary and Poland have some right to be resentful. On, in terms of the refugees, I just want to say one thing. Uh, what Germany did, the Willkommenskultur, was never consulted with any other member state of the European Union. In that sense, it was imposed on the rest of the European Union. Uh, you will recall the pictures, uh, I did see them in real time, uh, outside the Eastern Railway Station in Budapest, the Kennedy. Uh, it was profoundly shocking. It was profoundly shocking, not just for me, but I would have thought 90% of Hungarian opinion. It seemed understood, I'm using sociological terms, as a form of structural violence against which Hungarian opinion was helpless. So in a sense, what does it mean to have a Hungarian state which can't control who comes in, who comes out? In the very own sense, is this a state which actually controls its own territory? And the answer was no, it didn't. Hence the building of the fence. The fence, by the way, here again, the Western journalists still report this very accurately, is not to keep people out, it's to ensure that people go to the correct frontier crossing point where they can be registered. And I could talk to you here about Dublin regulations and Schengen obligations and so on. Um, so, I would say, as far as the refugees are concerned, there is a deeper point here, which is a point I made before in, in shock to international audiences. It's a matter of democratic choice, whether one wants to be multicultural or whether one does not want to be multicultural, and the Hungarian decision is no, Hungary does not want to be a multicultural country. Ja, also Sie haben, sind leider auf meine Frage gar nicht eingegangen. Wir können jetzt sozusagen anfangen, über Migration und Flüchtlinge zu reden, im Allgemeinen und im Besonderen. Und da kann jeder von uns eine unterschiedliche Auffassung haben. Mir geht es darum, wenn man unterschiedliche Auffassungen hat und in einem Rechtsstaat äh, entscheidet ein Gericht über diese Auffassung in einem bestimmten Punkt, dann ist es egal, was man vorher gemeint hat, dann muss man das Urteil akzeptieren. Und dazu haben Sie nichts gesagt. Warum Ungarn das Urteil nicht akzeptiert? Well, I think law and politics can never be separated entirely. Uh, my sense of it is that this issue with the Pastry Quotas uh, will come up on the agenda of the EU, EU Council, the Bulgarians are most of who hold the presidency at the moment are most reluctant to do anything. It may come up during the Austrian presidency, but uh, I do have figures. Uh, if compulsory quotas are imposed in Central Europe, there will be a major, I'm not sure what the right word is, hostile upsurge. It will certainly strengthen the European system. <laughs> Uh, the Czech Prime Minister, Andrzej Babish, has said this, expresses where this. So it may be possible, it may be the case uh, that Brussels will impose these compulsory quotas. I think it will be highly destructive if that happens. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I would like to add a point. Just a very short point. 
Sie haben einen wichtigen Punkt angesprochen, wo es auch noch einen weiteren, ich glaube schon ziemlich fundamentalen Unterschied, was die Werte angeht, gibt, nämlich die Frage Multikulturalität und Diversität. Und um es mal auf den Punkt zu bringen, wie Ihr Ministerpräsident das versteht. Orban hat wörtlich in einer Rede gesagt, we must state that we do not want to be diverse and do not want to be mixed. We do not want our own color, traditions and natural culture to be mixed with those of others. We do not want this. We do not want that at all. We do not want to be a diverse country. We want to be how we became 100 and 1100 years ago here in the Carpathian Basin. Und this tribal understanding, dieses Stammesdenken, das ist in der Tat nicht vereinbar mit europäischen Grundwerten, Grundrechten und dem Verständnis von pluralistischen Gesellschaften, wie sie den europäischen Verträgen zugrunde liegt. Und über diesen Dissens müssen wir auch sprechen. Und die Ungarn müssen, finde ich, auch sich dieser Diskussion stellen. Und da müssen wir sehen, wie wir die Sprachprobleme überbrücken, damit wir darüber wirklich auch in einen Dialog eintreten können. Denn ich kann mich noch gut erinnern, als ich 1994 im Bundestag kam, da war praktisch jede Woche eine Delegation aus den Beitrittsländern in Bonn damals noch und hat gesagt, wann kommen wir endlich in die NATO, wann kommen wir endlich in die Europäische Union und wir teilen eure Werte und jetzt können wir so leben nach den Werten, nach denen ihr lebt und jetzt auf einmal erklären sie uns, das war alles April, April, wir wollten eigentlich so leben wie vor 1100 Jahren. Das ist etwas, was ich nicht verstehen kann. Ähm, Herr Schuprin, erlauben Sie mir, dass ich jetzt doch eine weitere Frage stelle und Sie können dann auch noch auf Ruprecht Bolenz äh, eingehen, weil ich würde schon gerne noch mal zu der Ursprungsfrage eben zurückkommen, diese Frage von Regieren jenseits der Staatlichkeit und der Rück Zurückkehr des Staats, weil das ist ja genau das, was die ungarische Position jetzt ist, Sie haben es eben auch gesagt, Sie plädieren für eine starke Position der Mitgliedstaaten und es gibt offensichtlich sehr unterschiedliche Vorstellungen davon, wie die Europäische Union verfasst sein sollte. Und hier die unterschiedlichen Optionen, das eine ist, wie es weiter so, also im Sinne einer noch stärkeren Vergemeinschaftung und äh, dem Ruf nach den Vereinigten Staaten von Europa, wie der ehemalige Parlamentspräsident, EU-Parlamentspräsident Martin Schulz es ja auch vor kurzem gemacht hat, oder umgekehrt, und das ist ja die ungarische Position, der Ruf nach einer Rückkehr zum Europa der Nationalstaaten. Was konkret soll denn zurückgehen an die Nationalstaaten? Thank you very much. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to say we're not going to agree. But that's all right. Uh, as far as European values and diversity are concerned, which you said was in the treaty, let me read you Article 2 of the treaty. I have it on my telephone. Uh, the Union is founded on values of respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, respect for human rights, including the rights of persons belonging to minorities. These values are common to the member states in a society in which pluralism, non-discrimination, tolerance, justice, solidarity and equality between men and women prevail. No mention there of diversity or multiculturalism. I don't accept that multiculturalism is one of the founding values of Europe. Uh, and secondly, as far as Hungary is concerned, um, there is actually a Hungarian diversity, which I think insiders uh, tend to see, but outsiders underrate. I think uh, given the experience of Hungary, indeed, the other former communist countries have had, in terms of their national identity, don't be surprised that they are looking for time and space in which to construct a, a nationhood uh, that has within itself the potential, uh, perhaps even actually the actuality, of being taken seriously, of getting the, the parity of esteem that the European Union was originally set up uh, on the basis of. And here, by the way, something has changed. Historically, if you look at it, the role of the Commission was to protect the smaller states against the larger states. This is no longer done. The Commission no longer does this. 
It's the real danger, I think, for the European Union. When there are questions of nationhood, now, when I was younger, I did a lot of work on national identity, uh, nation construction, ethnicity. Um, I don't see the problem as, I, th I, mean, I make the distinction between nationhood, uh, the nation, nationalism, and then to take it further, chauvinism, and patriotism, you can use all these categories. Basically what I want to argue, is, and I have written this a long time ago, is that every nation is made up of a series of discourses um, about itself, uh, discourses of self. And some of these are clearly to do with ethnicity, some of these are to do with citizenship, some of these are to do with the international context. There are boundary mechanisms, there's a the whole symbolic uh, package, myth, uh, mythic narratives, and so on and so forth. Let me just give you one. Um, the, one of the Hungarian mythic narratives is that we arrived in Europe 1100 years ago, and we're all the descendants of our past. Well, I think I can safely say I don't have a drop of uh, tyrannic blood in my veins. It doesn't stop me being any more Hungarian than anybody else. But these are the mythic narratives that everybody has. Go back to Shakespeare talking about this precious stone set in a silver sea, and so on and so forth. Or the French talking about the hexagon. In France, really, the shape of the hexagon. In colonial times, children in, in West Africa were taught our ancestors the Gauls. Nos ancêtres les Gaulois. Totally absurd. It was a mythic narrative. And every national entity has these, what emphasis it puts on them varies. Uh, if you then translate this into what Hungary is doing at the moment, I think we're trying to put together uh, a Hungarian modernity and a Hungarian nationhood that is actually rather more successful than it has been for the last hundred years. Kurz noch zu der Frage, die ich eben gestellt habe, wenn, ich möchte doch nochmal darauf zurückkommen, ähm, wenn es jetzt die Forderung gibt, wieder nach einer Stärkung des Nationalstaats, ich rede jetzt gar nicht von, von ähm, Nationalismus, aber wenn es um die Stärkung des Nationalstaats geht, was genau soll denn dann zurückgehen in der EU? So, I'm not sure what you mean by going back. Wenn es, Wenn betont wird, welche Funktionen sollen denn zurückgehen, welche Aufgabenbereiche genau? Wenn es darum geht, oh, dass äh, betont wird, der Ruf nach der Rückkehr zum Europa der Nationalstaaten, dann heißt es ja, wir gehen, wenn wir rückwärts gehen, wir gehen einen Schritt zurück. Was genau soll sich denn dahinter verbergen? Was ist denn genau die Forderung und die Vorstellung, die dahinter steht? Um, there is a great deal in the European Union, and as I said, I'm a moderate integrationist, but I would completely support uh, environmental protection, for example, um, food safety, various very technical issues. Uh, where it seems to me uh, the divergence between the Member States and the Commission is getting stronger is the Commission's commitment to a federal union which I don't think actually it has uh, the legitimacy. Bear in mind, the Commission is very remote from the citizens. Um, I've fairly regular discussions uh, with certainly Commissioner Timmermans, but other commissioners as well. Um, there is a, a growing accumulation of power in Brussels for which the European Union is not accountable, that includes the European Parliament. That is where I think the better accountability is at the level of the member states, which may or may not be national or nationalist, but the member state, I think, is in many respects uh, a more successful um, locale for accountability of power. National parliamentarians are much closer to their voters than I am. I do my level best, and Hungary is much, it's much more difficult for my German colleagues. You know, there are 96 German MEPs and each one represents, I think, about a million and a half German citizens. I don't represent more than about 200,000, so I have an easier job. But the, the problem of remoteness of power is at the heart of one of the crises of the European Union. Here, I think uh, it would be preferable, from the perspective of democratic accountability, to restore power uh, to the member states. 
Äh, Ruprich Polenz, ähm, zum einen ähm, Ihr Kommentar zu der Funktion der Kommission. Die, die Schöpflin eben sagte eigentlich, dass auch die Funktion hat, die schwacheren Staaten zu schützen und offensichtlich tut sie das nicht. Also das ist ja ihre Position. Zum anderen wüsste ich von Ihnen, ich gehe davon aus, Sie sind ein dezidierter Befürworter einer weiteren Vergemeinschaftung in der Europäischen Union. Da würde mich interessieren, welche Bereiche wären es denn, die dann Ihrer Meinung nach weiter vergemeinschaftet werden sollten? Also fangen wir mit der zweiten Frage an. Der Jurist sagt immer, das kommt darauf an. Und äh, die, äh, der Grundsatz, nach dem man sich das angucken muss, ist das Subsidiaritätsprinzip. Also, äh, wenn eine Aufgabe, also danach müssen Aufgaben auf der Ebene möglichst nah am Bürger erfüllt werden, so nah es geht. Und dann gibt es eben Aufgaben, die kann man nicht mehr in einer Stadt erfüllen, weil sie Stadtgrenzen überschreitet. Also man kann Autobahnen nicht durch kommunale Zweckverbünde bauen lassen. Und deshalb ist dann eben für den Straßenbau das Land oder der Bund zuständig. Und ähnlich ist es auch bei anderen Erwartungen der Bürger an den Staat. Innere und äußere Sicherheit hat Aspekte, die Nationalstaaten noch erfüllen können aber hat eben zunehmend auch Aspekte, wo die Nationalstaaten an ihre Grenzen kommen. Deshalb finde ich es richtig, wenn jetzt überlegt wird, etwa im militärischen Bereich zu einer verstärkten militärischen Zusammenarbeit zu kommen, auch wenn wir natürlich von europäischer Armee, das werden wir alle nicht mehr erleben, noch weit entfernt sind. Aber ich würde das am Ende einer Entwicklung nicht ausschließen, wie überhaupt ja die europäischen Verträge, was ich ganz wichtig finde, offen angelegt sind. Es ist eine ein, ein ganz wichtiger, für mich ganz wichtiger Halbsatz, es geht um eine ever closer Union bei diesen Prozessen. Und das gibt die Richtung vor. Und ähm, bei, der, äh, bei der Bildung zum Beispiel kann ich mir durchaus auch vorstellen, das haben wir ja auch, europäische Mitwirkung an Forschung, an Stipendien an all diesen Dingen, aber es gibt keine Notwendigkeit, jetzt das sozusagen der Europäischen Union zu übertragen, sondern da haben wir die Länder, die das in Deutschland machen, in anderen Staaten, die nicht föderal organisiert sind, macht es der Zentralstaat. Beim Umweltschutz, da haben wir einen bestimmten Zuwachs auf die europäische Ebene bekommen, den man sich anschauen müsste. Also bei dieser Flora-Fauna-Habitat-Richtlinie legt die Europäische Union Naturschutzgebiete auch fest. Da bin ich nicht so sicher, ob das nicht Nationalstaaten oder vielleicht sogar Länder äh, mindestens genauso gut könnten, weil die das einfach auch besser kennen und näher dran sind. Also so muss man sich eben Beispiel für Beispiel anschauen und da liegt, wenn man jetzt rück an Rückübertragung denkt, der Teufel ein bisschen im Detail. Aber wir haben ja mit der Subsidiaritätsklausel jetzt nach dem Lissabon-Vertrag auch für nationale Parlamente die Möglichkeit, solche Fragen zu stellen und zu überprüfen, ob das nicht besser auf nationaler Ebene geregelt wird. Ich finde, also gerade meine Zunft, die Juristen streiten ja immer, wird das ein Zentralstaat? Sie haben von, davon gesprochen, wir wollen kein Federal State oder die Briten reden immer von einem Superstaat, den sie nicht wollten. Dann haben sich die Juristen in die Formel vom Staatenverbund geflüchtet. Also mir ist das sozusagen als Politiker erstmal relativ egal, wie man das nennt. Es geht darum, dass wir einen Prozess organisieren, einen Prozess zu einer ever closer Union, wo wir natürlich schauen müssen, dass wenn, und das ist eine schwierige Aufgabe, wenn Brüssel neue Aufgaben bekommt, müssen sie parlamentarisch kontrolliert sein. Und das heißt, man steht dann immer vor der Frage, übernimmt das Europäische Parlament die Kontrolle oder die nationalen Parlamente oder beide. Aber ohne einfach eine Kompetenzübertragung an die Brüsseler Bürokratie, das geht nicht. Also das ist die Aufgabe, vor der man sozusagen praktisch steht. Und zur Kommission, letzter Satz. Die Kommission ist nach dem Institutionengefüge der EU die Hüterin der Verträge. Ist das, was sozusagen, sozusagen der Inbegriff der Gemeinsamkeit im Unterschied zum Ministerrat, wo die Nationalstaaten vertreten sind, und zum Europäischen Parlament. Und da hat sich nun etwas eingewachsen oder besser gesagt ausgewachsen über die 
äh, verschiedenen Beitrittsstufen, äh, dass es quasi ein Naturgesetz geworden ist, jeder Staat hat seinen Kommissar. Mit verheerenden Folgen, wie ich finde. Äh, weil zum einen äh, damit diese, diese Idee, wir haben eine gemeinsame Institution verloren geht, weil jeder hat ja seinen Kommissar und der ist natürlich vor allen Dingen für die nationalen Interessen äh, da, oder man denkt das. Und es wird natürlich im Hinblick auf äh, Erkennbarkeit europäischen Handelns auch wahnsinnig schwierig. Also es wäre eine unglaub ein unglaublicher Reformschritt zu sagen, wir haben, was weiß ich, zwölf oder 14 Kommissare und das ist es. Und äh, wenn man das kriegen will, müssten wahrscheinlich Deutschland und Frankreich einem guten Beispiel vorangehen und sagen, also auf die erste Benennung verzichten wir, damit wir, damit wir da in die, in die Pötte kommen. Aber das wäre ein wirklicher Reformschritt, Verkleinerung der Kommission und Bildung von klar erkennbaren Ressorts. Mhm. Vielen Dank. Ich würde jetzt gerne auch für Fragen aus dem Publikum öffnen. Ähm, gibt es von Ihrer Seite... Fragen. Ähm, wir sammeln und ich würde Sie bitten, wirklich ganz kurz zu sprechen und äh, wir werden auch leider nur eine Fragerunde jetzt machen und dann gebe ich zurück, weil äh, wir rechtzeitig begrüßen. Ich fange hier bei den Herrn Unser an. Ja, ich wollte nur Herrn Bohlenz äh, kurz fragen, was die Kommission angeht, die Zusammensetzung der Kommission ist ja im europäischen Vertrag bereits geregelt. Und die Staaten haben uns mitgespielt, insbesondere die großen Staaten. Es ist eine Übergangslösung geschaffen worden, dass jeder europäische Staat mit einem Kommissar vertreten ist. Das ist im das ist schon klar. Das ist im, Vertrag, im gültigen Vertrag bereits geändert, es wird noch nicht durchgesetzt. Unter anderem auch, weil Deutschland natürlich nicht bereit ist, aber auf den Kommissar zu verzichten. Die zweite grundsätzliche Frage, ich bin also kein Osteuropa-Experte, aber ich bin ein bisschen Experte für Vereinte Nationen und die Europäische Union. Die Vereinte Nationen sind mir in der ganzen Diskussion als Handlungsforum für die Globalisierung viel zu kurz gekommen. Das nur nebenbei. Aber die Diskussion über Europa zeigt mir, woran diese Diskussion auch hier leidet. Es ist nämlich die ausgeklammerte Finalitätsfrage. Und das ist ein Aspekt für die Bevölkerung, dass man der Bevölkerung nicht offen erklärt, diskutiert, wohin geht die Reise. Lange Zeit ist in der europäischen Diskussion Entschuldigung, diese Frage völlig ausgeklammert worden. Und es war der damalige Außenminister Fischer in der bekannten Humboldt-Rede in Berlin, wo er gesagt hat, wir müssen uns endlich mal um die Finalität kümmern und wir müssen den Leuten sagen, wohin die Reise geht. Und wenn Herr Schulz, 100 Prozent Mann, äh, sagt die Vereinigten Staaten von Europa, so ist das also vielleicht seine persönliche Meinung, aber das ist nirgendwo durchsetzbar und das will letztlich auch niemand. Denn stellen Sie sich vor, eine europäische, ein europäischer Staat, wie würde die Regierungsform aussehen? Wer hätte das sagen? Und gehen Sie mal nach Berlin, ob die Herrschaften bereit wären, sich auch dazu unterwerfen, wenn Herr Kurz aus Österreich bestimmte Dinge auf die Tage dort umsetzt und das im Grunde gegeben wird, was ich glaube. Und das ist die Frage. Aber gut, da, aber dann, wir haben es, äh, gut, ähm, bitte, Herr Rode Liebenau. Und äh, tatsächlich muss ich leider bitten, ähm, stellen Sie kurze Fragen. Ähm. So kurz wie möglich. Ja, meine Frage an beide Referenten, der, der, der Herr Bohlen, Sie hatten am Anfang ja, den Begriff Integration ja, von Frau Kaiser kommen, ja, ins Gespräch gebracht. Meine Frage, wie weit kann die Integration gehen und gibt es nicht Probleme wegen der Führung in Anführungsstrichen durch Deutschland? Ja, unsere liebe Bundeskanzlerin wird ja immer wieder mit ihrer Führungsrolle erwähnt. Ja, es gab ja vor 1945 Zeiten, in denen manche ja, Menschen in Europa Zweifel an der Führung haben. Und die spezielle Frage an äh, Herrn Schöpflin, ja, Sie lebten ja lange in einem äh, kaiserlich-königlichen äh, Österreich-Ungarn, ist nicht die Erinnerung daran und die mangelnde ja, ähm, Anerkennung der ungarischen Rolle vielleicht noch ein Grund dafür, dass Sie mit diesem komplexen Leben auch in einer ganz anderen Umgebung 
Äh, bitte nach hinten. Äh, da waren zwei Wortmeldungen. Auf jeden Fall kommen wir hinten mal zu. Meine Frage wäre: Kann die EU als Softbau überhaupt die Interessen wirklich in der Welt vertreten, wenn wir noch sozusagen die Kartenaktien sehen, also die Kartenbau? Mhm. Also kann EU als Softbauer mhm. Okay, bitte. Mhm. Ich möchte gerne an die Diskussion anschließen über Föderalismus oder Integration. Ich glaube, das ist aus rechtlicher Perspektive tatsächlich eine interessante Debatte, in welchem Rahmen wir uns hier bewegen. Was hier, glaube ich, beide Konzepte verbindet, ist die Frage nach den zugrunde liegenden äh, Loyalitäten. Und da habe ich eine Frage an Herrn Schöpfin, der sich als gemäßigten Integrationisten äh, bezeichnet. Meiner Meinung nach ist die Europäische Union auch bei einer Stärkung der Nationalstaaten nur lebensfähig, wenn es in den einzelnen Staaten auch eine europäische Loyalität gibt. Das kann mit Wertdebatten passen oder auch mit Rechtsstaatlichkeit. Aber die äh, ungarische Regierung widerspricht also widerstreicht auf diesem äh, Prinzip, wenn sie sich in der Geschichtspolitik gegen die Deutschen wenn sie sich gegen ihre eigene jüdische Bevölkerung wendet, die jüdische Kultur muss doch mit der Staatsstruktur übereinstimmen. Äh, so, äh, wir, hatten, äh, nein, wir hatten hier vorne noch den Herrn äh, und dann müssen wir leider ausschließen. Ähm, ich habe spezifisch eine Frage an Herrn Schöpfli. Äh, er hat einen sehr interessanten Rat gegeben, Don't believe the newspapers. Äh, meint er, Herr Schöpflin, meint sich damit auch die ungarischen Zeitungen, äh, die ungarischen Zeitungen, die zu 90 Prozent in der Hand äh, von zwei Oligarchen sind, die der Regierung nahestehen und die dann solche Schlagzeilen verbreiten, wie Wien ist, Wien ist an den Islam gefallen, Berlin ist auf dem Weg ins Wettleiter wegen den Migranten. Äh, karitativer Organisationen, die Essen und Arme verteilen, wollen den Plan von George Soros bereits im Sommer umsetzen, eine Million Flüchtlinge nach Ungarn einzusiedeln und äh, dergleichen. Und ein absoluter Lieblings, äh, Lieblingsbericht aus dem Staat und Fernsehen, äh, Angela Merkels berühmte Raute, diese Geste ist ein untrügliches Zeichen dafür, dass sie den Illuminaten angehört. Äh, finden Sie, dass diese Medien, diese ungarischen Medien glaubwürdig sind? Oder sogar glaubwürdiger sind als westliche Medien. Gut, ähm, vielen Dank. Ähm, dann gebe ich jetzt zurück hier. Ich würde gerne auch noch eine Frage von meiner Seite dran nehmen, weil Herr Schöpflin, Sie haben es eben äh, schon gesagt, äh, es gibt eigentlich wenig Identifizierung mit der Europäischen Union. Sie haben einen Artikel geschrieben über die Position der ostmitteleuropäischen Staaten in der EU, der demnächst in der Zeitschrift Osteuropa veröffentlicht werden wird. Das schon als kleine Vorankündigung. Und äh, in diesem Artikel sprechen Sie darüber, weil Sie sagen, die EU ist eigentlich eine Demokratie ohne Demos. Wichtig ist natürlich an dieser Stelle, das ist auch eigentlich eine Frage an Sie beide, was muss denn die EU tun, um ähm, zu erreichen, dass es tatsächlich eine stärkere Identifikation aus der Bevölkerung herauskommt. Äh, bitte wählen Sie jetzt selbst, welche Fragen Sie beantworten würden, Herr Schöpflin. Ich beginne mit Ihnen. Well, thank you for your question. I'll start with Mr. Dobosch. Yes, that's my answer. Don't believe it. Uh, don't believe anything that you read in newspapers. Journalists these days are no longer committed to anything remotely resembling objectivity. Uh, hence, you know, uh, read everything with a, a considerable degree of skepticism. In whatever language you choose to read, that would be my advice. You don't have to follow it. Treat what I say with skepticism too, which I really do. Uh, okay, now uh, on uh, the problem of the, the demos. Um, it was the then Portuguese Prime Minister, the end of the Portuguese President, I think in 2007, 2008, who said, Democracy is Europe's DNA. I was so envious, I wish I'd thought of that. It's such a wonderful line. Unfortunately, there isn't a European demos. You probably know that Jean Monnet is supposed to have said, if he'd been able to start it again, he would have started it with culture. The problem I see is that there is a very dilute, very weak, but still real European identity. It's, much, it's an elite identity. It's probably more 
felt when one is in non-Europe. Um, it's easier to talk to other Europeans than to, well, I certainly felt it in Japan, I can assure you. Um, neither here nor there. But what we don't have is any very strong sense of the citizens of any the 20, I'll call it 27 member states, and even to take Brexit for granted, that they're simultaneously citizens of their state, the member state, and of the European Union. Um, when the second Irish referendum was held, um, the Irish commentators started to talk about the disconnect, which basically means that it's terribly difficult for people to identify at the two levels of political loyalty. That's to say, I'm simultaneously an Irish citizen and a European citizen, when the latter is not something that you encounter every day. And secondly, as I talked about before, the problem of accountability. You will never, you know, I mean, it's very rare for anybody to encounter a commissioner. It's not that easy, although one does one's best, uh, to meet a, a member of the European Parliament. It's simply physically impossible to do it. Those who do their best, those who don't do their best, never mind. So I can't quite see how uh, a demos in the political sense uh, is about to come into being. Let me add here that in terms of cultural practices, from the sociological, anthropological point of view, we are much more alike now than we were 50 years ago. Our consumption habits, um, our cultural consumption, I'm sure you, I don't know all of you, but quite a lot of you, I suspect, will look at astro astrological charts in the newspapers, um, the sport, the celeb culture. It's all a part of your, the actual the way in which um, supermarkets are laid out. They're very alike. Um, and then there is international English as a, a language of communication. That was not there 50, 60 years ago. In that sense, in terms of cultural practices, we were able to talk to each other in ways that, which are new. I can't see how, oh, and don't forget the Eurovision Song Contest. That's where Europe's uh, dark secrets are unveiled, where the small states vote down the large states, um, almost without exception. Um, what I can't see is how this is to be transformed or transferred into a political demos, it's a, a cultural demos. Um, now, there are a couple of other things that uh, I wanted to raise. I didn't understand the question about kings and emperors of Hungary. There have never been emperors of Hungary. There have been Austrian emperors who were kings of Hungary, hence the count car. I think that's uh, what I wanted to say. Um, on federalism or integration, well, this is very, this is a very complicated issue. What I would suggest is that you do look at Articles 4 and 5 of the treaty, which is, are about the conferral of power. The power which Brussels has has actually been conferred on it by the member states. Well, how much consent there was to that conferral at the popular level? Difficult question, I would say, probably not very much. Um, can any of that be, and this is also to your question, can it be clawed back? Theoretically it can, I think it would be very difficult to do it in practice. Um, I didn't quite understand the question about the Jewish population in Hungary. It's the, the, the third or the fourth largest Jewish community in Europe. Uh, they're all Holocaust survivors, or the children or grandchildren of Holocaust survivors. Um, and one of the reasons why the Hungarian government has taken this very strong line against becoming multiculturalists is to protect their Jewish community. If you recall in 15, when there was this large group of refugees around the Eastern Railway Station, uh, the large synagogue, which is a sort of 20 minute walk from there, was very, very carefully policed to ensure that no harm should be come to it. I think the present Hungarian government I've certainly been present when these have been said, has already accepted full responsibility for what happened in 1944, it's been said by uh, Orban himself, um, and I think that it, ha it understands that it has a historic responsibility towards protecting uh, the Jewish community. Um, I think that's probably all from me. Good. 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 Good.
ich fange mal mit der Finalitätsfrage an. Ähm, was das Verfassungsgefüge zwischen Mitgliedstaaten und äh, der EU angeht, glaube ich, wird es immer Bewegung geben in die eine oder andere Richtung. Das gibt es auch innerhalb Deutschlands, wenn Sie die Diskussion ums Kooperationsverbot sich anschauen. Also damit muss man, glaube ich, leben, dass äh, auch eine Verfassung, auch eine europäische Verfassung sich anpasst, verändert wird äh, und nicht in Stein gehauen ist. Und was die äußeren Grenzen angeht, haben die Kopenhagener Beitrittskriterien eigentlich klar gemacht, wie weit die Europäische Union maximal äh, sich ausdehnen kann. Allerdings eben nur unter der Voraussetzung, dass die Länder Demokratien sind, rechtsstaatlich verfasst, Minderheitenschutz haben und eine Marktwirtschaft, die dem Wettbewerbsdruck in der EU standhält. So, das ist eigentlich das, was man zur Finalität sagen kann. Die Frage, wie ist das mit einer Führungsrolle Deutschlands? Ich glaube, da muss man natürlich, es wäre ein extra Vortrag, aktuell Folgendes mit einbeziehen. Wir haben das erste Mal seit dem Zweiten Weltkrieg einen amerikanischen Präsidenten, der das europäische Einigungsprojekt nicht nur nicht unterstützt, sondern ihm eher skeptisch gegenübersteht. Das hat ziemlich starke Folgen auch äh, für unsere Möglichkeiten, äh, sozusagen eine Rolle in Europa zu spielen, weil da dürfen wir uns nichts vormachen. Für viele war die bisherige Rolle Deutschlands, die natürlich ziemlich stark ist in der Europäischen Union, nur, Klammer auf, Klammer zu, deshalb akzeptabel, weil man gesagt hat, die Amerikaner sind ja auch noch da und wenn die Deutschen wieder verrückt spielen, dann passen die schon auf. Jetzt sehr verkürzt gesagt. Und wenn diese Rolle der Amerikaner aus dem Bewu also im Bewusstsein von einigen unserer Nachbarn wegfallen würde, hätten wir ganz schnell ein ziemliches Problem. Das Zweite, was ich gerne dazu sagen wollte, es gibt ein Konzept, kann ich jetzt Ihnen nur das Schlagwort nennen, wenn Sie es googeln, das heißt Servant Leadership. Das heißt also eine Führungsrolle übernehmen, die aber erkennbar in allem, was sie vorschlägt, was sie macht, eine dienende Rolle gegenüber denjenigen einnimmt, die folgen soll. Das halte ich eigentlich für eine ziemlich plausible Idee für die Rolle, die Deutschland wahrnehmen muss auch, weil wir können uns nicht benehmen wie sozusagen eine etwas zu groß geratene Schweiz. Dann würden wir unserer Verantwortung auch innerhalb der Europäischen Union nicht gerecht. Was die Frage Soft Power, Hard Power angeht, ich glaube schon, dass äh, nach wie vor äh, die Attraktivität des europäischen Modells das Hauptfund ist, mit dem wir wuchern können und sollten. Aber natürlich äh, zeigen die äh, Bemühungen äh, jetzt im engeren Sinn im militärischen Bereich, dass sich die Europäische Union, siehe Mali, beispielsweise auch um das Unterlegen einer Politik gegen die Destabilisierung eines wichtigen afrikanischen Landes eben auch militärisch versucht zu unterlegen. Aber die Geschichte der Militäreinsätze nach 1990 ist ja nun nicht gerade eine so unbefragte Erfolgsgeschichte, dass man sagen würde, also das ist das Mittel der Wahl, sondern es ist allenfalls eben immer wieder Ultima Ratio. Aber realistischerweise muss man sagen, wir werden über Hard Power und wie viel wir brauchen und wie wir sie kriegen in den nächsten Jahren ziemlich sicher diskutieren. Ich will an der Stelle auch sagen, ich rechne damit, dass wenn die Unsicherheit über den amerikanischen sicherheitspolitischen Kurs, insbesondere in der Nuklearfrage, weiter zunimmt, dann werden wir einmal im pazifischen Raum bei den Japanern, bei den Südkoreanern die Überlegung sehen, ob sie dann für sich selber sorgen müssen. Und spätestens dann werden wir das in Europa auch diskutieren und dann die Frage haben, wie ist das mit den französischen und britischen Möglichkeiten, und wie sind die sozusagen für ganz Europa nutzbar zu machen im Sinne einer glaubwürdigen nuklearen Abschreckung? Also da stehen uns auch was Hardpower angeht spannende Diskussionen bevor. Und letzter Punkt, europäisches Bewusstsein. Wir haben heute ein Fußballpanel hier. Es gibt einen sportlichen Wettbewerb, wo ganz klar es um Europa gegen jemand anders geht, das ist der Riders Cup beim Golf. 
Und äh, das ist eine hochemotionale Angelegenheit, jedenfalls für alle, die Golf spielen. Und da äh, ist eben nicht Spanien und nicht Großbritannien äh, sozusagen der Gegner der USA, sondern Europa. Und das wird in, den Ameri in Amerika so gesehen, auch in Europa. Also das ist ein Bereich. Sie haben den Song Contest genannt. Ich will noch ein paar andere nennen, um zu zeigen, dass dieses Bewusstsein, ich gehöre zu etwas mit anderen zusammen und das endet nicht, an der deutschen, an der ungarischen oder an der äh, polnischen Grenze. Das sind natürlich, ist natürlich der Euro. Es ist natürlich die Möglichkeit heute für junge Leute, äh, ohne äh, überhöhte Roaminggebühren, äh, sich in einem europäischen Raum zu bewegen, äh, wie es das äh, früher nicht gab. Und ich glaube, wenn wir ein europäisches Bewusstsein weiter fördern wollen, müssen wir viel stärker über solche Möglichkeiten nachdenken, die einfach äh, die Unterschiedswirkung, ob ich auf der einen Seite oder der anderen Seite einer staatlichen Grenze lebe, im Hinblick auf mein persönliches Wohlbefinden, meine Bedürfnisse, abflacht. Und je mehr das der Fall ist, glaube ich, umso interessanter ist es, sich also auch eben als Europäer zu verstehen. Und wenn Sie an junge Leute, äh, wenn Sie auf junge Leute zugehen, etwa in Polen, dann haben Sie ein starkes Kontrastprogramm etwa zu dem, was die PIS beispielsweise sagt. Und man sollte sich jetzt von außen geguckt nicht alleine darauf kaprizieren, äh, was eine Regierung sagt, sondern man sollte sich wirklich auch die Zivilgesellschaften anschauen und was wir heute von den Universitäten in, in Ungarn, also der, der Europäischen Universität in, in Budapest gehört haben und über die, die wissenschaftliche Vernetzung, das sind alles äh, ja, Institutionen, die per se nicht in nationalstaatlichen Grenzen denken. Also es gibt wahrscheinlich keine ungarische Mathematik, ich lasse mich überraschen, aber äh, ich glaube es eher nicht. Und von daher sind eben diese ganzen äh, Mechanismen eigentlich dazu angetan, das als einen Fortschritt zu sehen, was ich jedenfalls zutiefst als Fortschritt sehe. Als ich 1969, 68 in Münster anfing zu studieren und man wollte in die Niederlande fahren, hatte man doch ziemlich massive Grenzkontrollen. Heute merken Sie gar nicht mehr, wenn Sie über die Grenze fahren. Vielen Dank. Ich denke, die Diskussion hat uns sehr gut gezeigt, dass es tatsächlich sehr, sehr unterschiedliche Positionen darüber gibt, wie es aktuell um die EU steht, aber auch wie es in der EU weitergeht. Schwierig wird es sicherlich auch darüber jetzt Prognosen zu stellen. Ich möchte auch über den Song Contest keine Prognosen hier abgeben. Ich bin aber ziemlich zuversichtlich, was die Weiterentwicklung der WGO im nächsten Jahr angeht und kann Ihnen schon jetzt mit großer Bestimmtheit sagen, dass wir uns am 14. und 15. März in Berlin wieder treffen werden, 2019. Und ich hoffe, dass Sie alle dabei sind. Damit kommen wir zum Ende einer hoffentlich für Sie alle auch so spannenden Tagung wie für uns. Und äh, ich möchte nicht versäumen, mich zum Schluss noch einmal ganz herzlich zu bedanken. Äh, ganz herzlichen Dank tatsächlich an die Dolmetscher. Und ich glaube, die haben uns im Applaus. Und dann bedanke ich mich natürlich ganz herzlich bei unseren Kooperationspartnern bei der Graduierten Schule für Ost- und Südosteuropa-Studien. Ganz herzlichen Dank an Martin Schulze-Wessel.